So let me introduce you to Professor Dr. Maria Dornelas. Maria Dornelas is a professor at the University of St. Andrews, Scotland. She was an undergrad student at Universidade de Lisboa and obtained her PhD at James Cook University in Australia. Her research falls under the disciplines of community ecology, macroecology, and biogeography. She works on intermediate spatial temporal scales, and her research combines ecological theory, synthesis of existing data, and field work, preferably in exotic places by her own words. So, Maria, whenever you feel ready, it's up to you. Um, olá a todos, vou começar só um instante para falar em português, porque não é sempre que consigo uh, falar do trabalho em português. Um, um, but I will eventually switch to English. Um, so I'd, I'd like to start by thanking you um, for the invitation to be here and talk a little bit about the research that I and my group um, do. Um, it's a real privilege to be here. I'm sorry I can't be there in person. <laughs> um, I would have loved to meet you um, in, like, in person, but this is the next be best thing. Um, and we, you know, and it meant that I can um, go to Brazil, do a talk, and then st and still be home for dinner. <laughs> um, um, so without further ado, oh, I also want to say that I've been watching the, the talk so far and, um, and learning so much. And, um, and I'm also really looking forward to the excellent uh, talks that will uh, follow uh, me throughout the week. So um, thank you to the organizing com um, committee for putting together such a, a brilliant list of, um, um, of speakers. I'm really humbled to be um, included here. I'm going to now start sharing my screen. Um, here we go. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Somehow this is not. Se você precisar de ajuda, pode falar, tá, professora? Okay, it should be working now. Here we go. Right? Share screen. Yes, okay. Um, can you see my screen okay? Not yet. Can you see my screen yet? Sim. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. Right. And it's and you can see it properly now with the presentation, yeah? Yeah, we do. Okay, here we go. Right. So sorry about that. <laughs> um, so uh, the title of my talk today is Biodiversity Change in the Anthropocene. Um, I, it's, although I'm the one presenting this work, it's not just my work, it's um, the combined work of lots of different people, um, namely the Biotime Core Group, uh, Vivi, um, Ada, Faye, Laura, Amanda and Anne. Um, as well as long-term collaborators, Nikitelli and Brian McGill um, and Hideyasu Shimatsu, um, uh, the S-Change Working Group and, and specifically um, Shane and Sarah, um, a PhD student, um, Gregana Daskalova, who's co-supervised by Isla Meyer-Smith, um, my long-term long collaborator, Josh Maiden, as well as um, long list of people who helped me in the field and I'm not gonna read everyone's names. And last but definitely not least, um, everyone in my lab and, and Grimm's lab, because we have um, a shared um, lab group. Um, and then, of course, I want to uh, thank all the funders that uh, make um, the science I'm about to talk about um, uh, possible. Um, <clears throat> okay, so this is a workshop on community ecology, but as I was uh, putting together this talk, I um, 
kind of realized that my um, over the years I have increasingly verged towards the macroecology end of community ecology, um, and I hope that's okay. Um, and um, I, I feel that community ecology has a great deal to offer um, to macroecology and vice versa. And I think I think I work at the interface between these two um, these two disciplines of um, of ecology, in that I am interested in um, groups of species that live in one place, um, um, but I'm typically interested um, in extracting sort of general trends that um, um, that communities and, and assemblages um, um, sh show. So, um, I've, uh, like the biggest sort of overarching uh, question that has been dominating uh, my research in the recent past um, is how biodiversity is changing um, across the planet. Now, in an ideal world, um, we would do what um, Dasta does on Star Trek and use um, a scanner to scan the planet for life forms and then do that repeatedly through time um, to figure out exactly what is happening to biodiversity, where, you know, where the different species that live on this planet um, are, whether or not, um, how their distributions change. Um, of course, in, you know, the year is 2020 rather than 2371. So we're not quite there yet in terms of scanning the planet for life forms. Um, but um, I would like to argue, in fact, I did argue um, last year in a paper we published um, in Global Ecology and Biogeography that we are slowly approaching um, uh, the technology that would allow us to build um, a scanner of sorts as um, uh, something I call the macroscope, um, which uh, rather than being a machine um, uh, or a single machine, um, would actually be a collection of different um, sensors deployed around the planet, some deployed in outer space like satellites, um, some deployed um, in situ like um, uh, camera traps and passive acoustic um, samplers, um, um, some deployed um, on animals to help us of survey parts of the planet where humans don't go, um, some just traveling on their own like drones and, um, and um, AUVs, um, as well as the thousands if not millions of humans who um, survey the environment all the time. Um, and a combination of all of these approaches, if, if we used them, if we had them deployed uh, um, it, using stratified random sampling on a, pla on a planet would give us the ideal data set um, to be able to um, unambiguously answer the question, how is biodiversity changing on a planet? And I, I think that um, this, uh, you know, a vision of a microscope is possible, but evidently it doesn't exist yet. Um, I think ecologists should argue that um, that you know, funding should be made available so that we do build a microscope, so that we do have access to um, um, uh, the equivalent for ecologists of, for, of um, the Hubble Space Telescope and you know, the equivalent for um, ecologists to the physicists' um, Great Hadron Collider. But it doesn't exist just yet. Um, and, and, um, and, and I guess an important point about um, wanting to figure out what, how biodiversity is changing, uh, the one thing that I don't think we'll be able to resolve um, anytime soon, at least, is, is to be able to travel in time. And so if we want to know how biodiversity is changing, we, do, we, need, to, we need to use data that has already been collected. Um, and that has largely been the goal of the Biotime database, um, which is a database of biodiversity time series we host here um, in, St. in St. Andrews. Um, the, the database is the collective work of a very long list of authors. Um, the first paper we published, um, uh, making the database av available in 2018, included 271 authors. Um, we are working towards version two um, of the database. Um, and um, as you will see in a second, it will include a lot more. Because in order to survey biodiversity across the entire planet, it, um, it, it's not, it can't be the work of a single person. It needs to be a collective effort of, of lots and lots of people. And 
um, if we want to be able to um, to tackle big questions like how biodiversity is changing across the entire planet, then we, we need to be we need to be able to synthesize information from uh, the work of lots of different people. And the only way that we can do do that and be fair to the work that um, goes um, into collecting these data is uh, by um, um, having data papers like the one we published in, in 2018, where everyone who has um, uh, collected uh, data is invited to be a co-author. Um, our colleagues over in astronomy have done this for ages and they need to collaborate in order to, um, uh, to to be able to build and have access to big um, infrastructure um, so that they can survey the universe. If we want to survey the planet, um, we, need, we need to have a similar approach um, towards data sharing and, um, and also towards giving credit to data collection because data collection is, I guess in some ways, um, like the poor cousin of, of, of ecology, right? It's the thing, but if we're totally honest, if I'm totally honest, it's the data collection is what got me into ecology. It was the 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 prospect of being able to um, to go diving on coral reefs. This, if I'm totally honest, is what is what makes me is what made me uh, want to do this for a living. Um, I I came I came for the dives and I stayed for the questions. Um, but I did come I, I came for the dives. Um, and um, but having done enough dives now to appreciate just how much hard work goes into data collection. I feel very, very strongly that um, it's important to give uh, credit to the people who collect data. So anyway, that's what that's partly what the Biotime uh, database um, is about. And um, 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 and let me, t let me show you a little bit of what, what kind of data we've been putting together. So we'd, we're interested in, in um, in time series, whereas where a time series is um, uh, any uh, repeated uh, survey of a location um, uh, through time, so that includes more than two years, um, and uh, and this is the, our current spatial coverage and and the length of the time series that we um, that we include, and I'm pretty proud of this. Um, map, even though I am keenly aware of uh, the gaps um, we we still have. Um, uh, so anyway, at the moment, um, and uh, and since the, uh, in the two years since we published the data paper, the database um, has kept growing. Um, we now have uh, 438 um, source data sets. As of this morning, I got confirmation, um, <laughs> around 13 million um, species occurrence records, um, where a record is the abundance of a species at a place and a time. Um, we cover around 700,000 locations, over 45,000 species, and our time series span from the 1800s to the present. Although, if I'm honest, really, the vast, vast majority of our time series span from um, the, the past, you know, 40 to 50 years. Um, like I said, this is a living resource. It's still growing. Um, thanks to the Leverholm Center for Anthropocene uh, Biodiversity, we have funding to keep the database growing. This started out as, a, it's called Biotype because it started out as, um, uh, as part of Anne McGurin's uh, Biotime um, ERC project, um, but um, the database um, is still growing. Um, here are the uh, faces of some of the people behind its growth. Um, uh, uh, some of these people were not included in the 2018 paper because they hadn't joined our, our, our labs yet, uh, but uh, if they, um, we, are very, very keen to uh, recruit more data if you have um, data uh, that you'd like to contribute. Um, and also we're very, very keen to um, uh, promote the use of the data we already have and that is publicly available in the database um, website. So feel free to use it, feel free to get in touch um, um, if you have data that you would like to contribute and you can help us uh, fill the map that I showed before. Um, in the process of putting together um, the database uh, and, and largely um, inspired by an idea that Amanda Bates um, had 
we realize that every single one of the uh, records we have on our database actually corresponds to a human being um, interacting with the natural world. And because most of us do field work as well, we wondered about what stories people have gone through in the process of collecting these data. Um, and so we decided we launched this year um, a new initiative called Storytime, um, where we are um, collating um, all kinds of different adventures um, that the uh, that people who do field work uh, go through. Um, and this photograph here is, um, is one I wrote uh, for Storytime about a time when um, I was out surveying a coral reef and as I jumped in the water, a giant clam had decided that our an anchor chain was very, very tasty and held on to it. And if you want to hear what happened to it, you have to check out um, our website. Um, but equally, same as with the data, we are um, inviting contributions of stories. And, and part of what we want to do here is, is again, celebrate um, the wonderful, crazy adventures we go through while collecting ecological data. Okay, so we have lots of data. Um, uh, depending on who you talk to, uh, the, you know, some people would actively discourage us from saying that we have big data because um, uh, we don't have billions of records, but we definitely have a lot of data. But a very, very important point I want to make is that data does not equal knowledge. Um, it, 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 in fact, most of my research career um, is, is, is spent at, at this unequal sign over here. So trying to bridge the gap between that and knowledge. I would argue most of any scientist's career is spent there. Um, and if we want to um, if you want to get knowledge, um, as Anne McGurin always says, you have, you have to uh, really focus on what your question is. And, and I started with a question, and so let's, let's go back to what the question was. The question I said is driving most of my, um, the research in my group at the moment is how is biodiversity changing across the planet? Um, and so in order to do that, um, we, um, we, we decided to quantify um, uh, lots of different metrics of biodiversity. It will come as no surprise to anyone here, I imagine, <clears throat> uh, that there isn't a single metric that can um, um, quantify uh, biodiversity. Um, but there are some metrics that are particularly famous, and species regions is probably the most famous um, of them all. And species regions is just the total number of species that you find um, at a particular time and a place. In fact, to be more accurate that we find within a sample, uh, we never observe true species richness, we only ever observe um, um, a sample. And it's important to always um, have that in mind. So, um, so uh, in among other uh, um, metrics, um, I think, uh, I forget the exact numbers at the moment, but I think it's something like around 20 different metrics we were quantified at the time when the database was, was a lot smaller. So when we didn't have the first 100 data sets within Biotime, we quantified how species regions changed through time. And our results were um, somewhat surprising. So what we found was that when we had um, species regions on the y-axis here um, as a function of time um, on the x-axis here, um, uh, we were expecting to find mostly declines because it is, after all, the Anthropocene, a time when humans are uh, cutting down forests um, and um, uh, doing all kinds of uh, terrible things to, to the environment. So we were expecting to find mostly declines. And instead, what we found was a mess. Uh, declines and increases and uh, lots of flat lines. And so we fitted a model um, that um, allowed different um, um, slopes and different intercepts for each of the each of the 100 data sets we had at the time um, and also estimated an overall uh, general um, um, trend and uh, much to our surprise the general trend which is the black line in this plot here is flat um, it's undistinguishable from zero um, it turns out that the de declines and um, and increases um, cancel each other out so that on average we cannot detect um, um, decreasing um, species richness. 
Um, in contrast, um, we, we also wanted to look at um, another very important metric of biodiversity, which is um, um, compositional change. Um, we found some very striking trends in terms of temporal turnover in composition. Um, we measured um, a turnover using the jacquard similarity. So we compared each point in a time series, um, the composition of each point in a in, in time series with its composition at the start of the time series um, and uh, using the jacquard index, which goes from zero when there are no species in common between the two uh, time points um, to one when every species that was present there at, at, at the start is also present there um, in the second time point. And what we found was that um, species are being consistently replaced. So there is turnover in terms of um, uh, composition um, and that this turnover was uh, you know, one to two or, uh, orders of magnitude higher than we would expect from uh, two different norm models, um, uh, uh, competition and colonization norm model, as well as um, a neutral model. So this is evidence uh, we find that rather than, um, um, you know, what our data shows is that rather than having a systematic loss um, in biodiversity, what we see is indication of systematic change in biodiversity. So turnover in composition, replacement of species. When this paper came out um, in 2014, it was fairly controversial, let's put it that way. Um, and I got um, a lot of not always nice feedback, um, uh, including accusations that I was undermining um, conservation efforts because after all, are humans not turning the world into a parking lot? Are you arguing that you know deforestation is not happening? Something must be wrong with your data um, was an argument that um, I heard quite a lot. Um, and I've been, we've, well, collectively we've been, we've been addressing this, um, these questions because we were equally surprised by these results. Um, interestingly, uh, Mark Vellen was working in parallel um, on a, a similar uh, um, and uh, unrelated um, project on plants and he found fairly similar results um, to us. Um, so anyway, um, um, one of uh, my PhD students, um, Gargana Daskalova, who is co-supervised by Isla Maya Smith at the University of Edinburgh, um, decided to tackle this uh, question by looking at the um, uh, the effects of um, forest change on, um, on biodiversity change, because it is so commonly used as, um, as an argument for we must absolutely be um, un undergoing um, a chain, uh, uh, loss in, in biodiversity. So the first thing that Gurgana did was to ask herself how representative um, the biotime data um, was of um, the, the the, loss, the, the losses and gains in, 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 in forests that we see on a planet. So um, she is evidently only using a subset of the biotime database, which covers both the marine and terrestrial and freshwater um, realms. So she's focusing only on a terrestrial realm and only on um, locations that um, have had at some point in history uh, forests there. And so she compared the uh, prevalence of uh, different levels of forest cover loss and forest cover gain in the biotime database uh, represented in blue here, um, as well as the in the leading planet um, uh, index uh, database represented in yellow here, we, what we would expect if we had um, random sampling of the planet, which is what we have here um, in, in purple. And what you know what we see, what we can, what we um, conclude from this comparison is that actually, you know, um, it is you know, biotime is missing uh, the you know very rare uh, but very extreme cases um, of forest cover, but it actually does a reasonably good job of of um, of sampling the, of the spatial um, uh, representation of forest cover loss and, and forest cover um, and gain. 
where we see um, a, a clearer disconnect, and this applies to both uh, biotime um, and the Living Planet database, is in the temporal representation of forest cover change. Um, it turns out that a lot of uh, forest cover change is, is fairly old. Um, and, I mean, deforestation is still happening today, as I'm sure comes as no surprise to people even in Brazil, um, uh, but, um, but not everywhere. And, and it's also not a new thing. Um, a great deal of deforestation um, happened in, um, in uh, you know, the 1800s and 1900s before we had started a monitoring biodiversity in earnest because most of the biodiversity monitoring um, um, is only happening, uh, only really started in earnest from the 1950s, 40s to, to, them, um, to the present. Um, this is not to say that there isn't um, a forest loss and forest gains now, there, there definitely is. It's just that it's much older than, um, than we probably um, commonly appreciate. So um, this is the biodiversity data that we have, and we can still ask the question of what is happening um, to biodiversity in the places that are um, undergoing um, forest change, and we can compare gains and losses in um, 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 be before and after um, uh, forest loss. Um, so Gargana's analysis is far more complex that I'm going to uh, present you here. Um, I'm only doing a whistle stop tour of the work that she's done, and I recommend that you check um, the paper that she published in um, Science earlier this year. The take home message really is that um, if we compare um, uh, trends um, uh, before uh, versus um, after, so before is the dotted line, after is the full line um, forest loss, uh, what we see is that um, uh, species richness trends become uh, um, more uh, negative um, after um, uh, forest loss. Um, but they also become more, um, tend to become more extreme, um, um, uh, which is gains also tend to become uh, more extreme, although uh, far less so. The bottom line um, from this analysis, um, and this and the similar pattern, but more, more clearly emerged from analysis of population trends as well in the Living Planet um, database, um, where the take home message from this analysis is that forest change is, um, is really a catalyst for both um, increased gains and losses in biodiversity, rather than just a, a catalyst for losses. And although at first this may seem counterintuitive, if we think a little bit um, about this, um, I think what it shows is that uh, when we cut down a forest, um, there are some organisms that benefit from that, um, uh, although, um, and, and other benefits. So there are winners and losers from, from, from forest change. It's not just, just loss. So the next analysis that I want to talk about um, is broader than, um, than this one focusing on, on, on forest change and, and looks at the spatial variation of um, trends in biodiversity. We call this study um, the geography of biodiversity change and it was um, something that we developed as part of an estive working group called S-Change and it was led by Shane Blows and, um, and Sarah Sapp and it came out in science um, last year. So in this study, um, a really important thing that we did was to standardize spatial scale. Um, and in the talk uh, that uh, John Chase, who's also part of this study, uh, will give uh, later in the week, I'm sure he will um, explain how important it is um, to keep um, spatial scale um, standardized. And so that meant that we went from having hundreds of time series to having, you know, tens of thousands of time series because um, Biotime has some data sets that are very, very large in extent, uh, like for example, the breeding bird surveys of North America, as well as um, you know, lots of uh, 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 fisheries data sets that are repeated in lots of spaces in time. And so um, one thing that, uh, that we've learned in the process is that actually trying to plot 50,000 time series is um, challenging. <laughs> You typically end up with just clouds of points, uh, like solid clouds of points, and not, you can't really 
do that thing that I love doing, which is actually, you know, looking at what the data shows you because the data is too much. And so, um, uh, and, and it also means that um, things like hypothesis testing don't really make a lot of sense um, when you have so much data. So instead, uh, we used Bayesian hierarchical models. And we fitted um, a couple of, of different models, and, uh, but I'm going to specifically, specifically focus um, on, um, on just two. So uh, we fitted a model that had that allowed different trends for both uh, biomes, the interaction between biomes and taxa, and another one that had a realm, latitude, um, and taxa. Um, it turns out that uh, differences between between taxa were typically not very clear and not very important. What we do find a clear differences is um, across um, space. Um, and across realms. Um, so this is a map of um, the first model that, that I just uh, described. Um, in, in it, we have color coded the, uh, the, the marine biomes for which we have uh, data according to whether they are above um, in blue or below in sort of red to pink, um, the global trend. Um, and what we see is that for the marine realm, there's quite a lot of blue, so quite a lot of places that have um, trends above the global average. Um, and then there is fewer, um, um, but some are below. Um, and the ones that are below the global trend tend to be um, concentrated around sort of warmer parts of the planet. In the terrestrial realm, um, in contrast, and this is, um, you know, it's part of the same model that I showed you before, but it's very difficult to depict the both um, realms in the same map. Um, uh, the figure is a bit more mixed, um, um, and what we see is, um, uh, when I've shown this before, some people uh, suggested that maybe what we have here is, is an influence of, of the distribution of human populations. Um, but clearly, the, 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 we, we, see, we see more warmer colors, so more reds and oranges and, and definitely fewer um, blues and definitely fewer um, uh, sort of dark blues. So, so the larger uh, positive um, uh, departures from the global estimate. And the pattern is even more striking when we look at uh, turnover instead of species richness. Um, uh, so here uh, we have you know, similar maps, the ones that I showed you before, but instead of looking at, um, at trends in species richness, we're looking at trends in turnover. And, um, and we see that there, there's a lot more blue in the marine um, uh, realm than there is there's a lot more red in the terrestrial realm. And just to help you interpret what, what this means, so the blue ones are the ones that are changing faster than the global average. The red ones are the ones that are ch changing more slowly than, um, than the global average. So for both um, um, turnover and, um, and species richness, um, the take home message from this um, geographical analysis is that the marine realm is changing much, much faster in biodiversity um, than is the terrestrial realm. And this was a surprising result that we were not um, expecting. Um, so in parallel with this work, um, we have, have also been uh, uh, working towards understanding the distribution of threats for, um, for biodiversity. Um, because we wanted to do some attribution analysis, um, and because the biotime is a database that stretches across the uh, marine and terrestrial and freshwater um, realms, uh, we realized when we, um, we were to do an um, attribution analysis that uh, terrestrial and marine ecologists tend to work separately. And there aren't really, there weren't really sort of spatial layers that allowed um, analyzing um, the entire planet, um, uh, you know, using the, sa the same spatial layers. And so Diana Bowler, um, uh, in combination with, um, an, uh, with you know, the rest of us at S Change, and following an idea that um, Amanda Bates uh, put forward, set out to map um, um, human pressures 
um, across the planet and to create um, sort of combined spatial layers that tell us where these threats are, as well as understand what the spatial um, autocorrelation patterns look like. And so this is what the result of this effort is. Um, she created a map uh, that sort of puts together the cumulative effects um, across uh, both realms of uh, the different threat layers, um, and the different threat layers being largely sort of climate change, human use, human pollution, um, human, sorry, human population, pollution, and, and the potential for alien invasion. Um, and so what we see here is that there, there is this um, quite um, unequal distribution of where uh, threats are, as well as if you compare um, the maps on the bottom here, um, it, becomes, it becomes clear that different parts of the world are experiencing different, um, different combinations of threats. Um, and so um, uh, in, in Diana's paper, we, we decided to call these ATCs or anthropogenic threat complexes. And, and we hope that this will help people um, uh, now sort of go and figure out whether or not there are signatures of these um, ATCs on, on patterns of biodiversity change. Um, Diana also um, focused on, on actually understanding the spatial um, patterns of, um, 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 of, of distribution of these threats. Um, and a really interesting pattern that she found um, was that the spatial autocorrelation patterns were quite different between the terrestrial and the marine um, realms, in that in the terrestrial realms, most threats were um, um, correlated with each other. Um, so places where you had high pollution, you also tended to have um, high human hues and high human population, high alien potential, etc. cetera. Um, the exception being climate change which seems to be spatially uncorrelated uh, with, um, with all of the other threats. And what this means is that um, on land and the places that are warming up the faster are not the places where you have you know, most of the other human threats. Um, uh, in contrast, um, in the marine realm, um, again, we see this disconnect um, between the, uh, the, the climate change variables and the other ones, but a lot, there are a lot fewer strong correlations there and a lot stronger correlations within the climate change um, um, uh, variables. What is also interesting is that if you look at the, um, like all of the correlations, so that the previous uh, uh, graph focused only on the strongest of the correlations. If you look at all of the correlations, this, the sign of the correlations is, um, is really um, interest, interesting as well, in that um, it shows us that um, for, um, also for weak correlations, um, in the terrestrial realm, correlations tend to be, uh, correlations with, with climate change variables tend to be negative, but in the marine realm, correlations with, um, um, with the climate variables tend to be positive. What this tells us is that um, in the marine realm, places that are undergoing climate change also tend to have um, several other threats um, at the same time. And so a tentative hypothesis that um, um, arises from this is that this enhanced, this, this higher uh, rate of change in the marine realm is maybe at least potentially uh, driven by the fact um, that the, uh, the, the special distribution of, of threats is different across the two realms. Okay, so climate change, I've talked a little bit about climate change. And um, one of the things that we have been um, specifically focusing on is on the effects of climate change. Um, and, and, and we asked ourselves, so we have all these um, biodiversity time series. Um, we knew we also could get our hands on um, temperature time series. Is there um, a relationship between yeah. how temperature um, is, um, is changing and how um, uh, biodiversity is changing? And this is work that was led uh, by a former uh, PhD student, uh, Laura um, Antal, and that was published earlier this year in Nature Ecology and Evolution. So, um, so Laura um, 
uh, picked a, a subset of uh, the time series in, in by time for which we had a, a minimum of, of five years of, um, of sampling. And then she recovered uh, temperature data for the same locations as um, these uh, biodiversity time series. Um, and this is a plot of what the distribution of those um, look like. So we have the trend um, um, here on the x-axis and the absolute latitude um, on the y-axis. So this this is the, you know towards the equator over here and towards the um, uh, the poles um, at the top. Um, you'll notice that um, the plots are truncated at uh, 23.5 and 60 degrees, and this is because most of the data that we have is from the temperate region and we felt uh, we had very different hypotheses for what is happening in the tropics and the poles um, in contrast to what is happening in the temperate zone and we felt that we simply did not have enough data from these other parts of the world to um, go test this hypothesis um, accurately. Um, and so what we see here is that there is variations of some, so some places are warming, some places are cooling, um, uh, some you know, places that are towards the equator tend to have sort of longer, so warm, warmer colors, lo uh, um, higher long-term temperatures, uh, places uh, towards the poles tend to have colder long-term temperatures. There's quite a lot of variation. Um, but on average, um, evidently, uh, we detect that um, um, the planet is warming, um, although it's not warming everywhere and it's definitely not warming everywhere at the same rate. So this is the distribution of um, uh, temperature trends um, in green for the terrestrial realm and in blue for the marine realm. And you see that the, both the mean and the median are positive, but you know, some places are actually cooling as a circulation patterns change, for example. And we have you know, things like um, El Nino, Northern oscillations and, and all kinds of uh, climate phenomena that I'm not an expert on. <laughs> um, and a similar thing um, is seen for um, sea species richness change and that some places are gaining species and some places are um, losing species. And actually um, on average um, uh, for this subset of data, we actually see um, uh, an increase um, of species richness. And so she, uh, Lara fitted a model um, that um, uh, try to explain um, species richness change as a function of both temperature change and uh, long-term um, temperature. And, um, and these are the results of her model. Um, so she found a significant interaction between um, the two uh, terms. So between temperature change and long-term temperature for the marine realm, but not the terrestrial realm. Um, and what this means is because I, I always find interaction are difficult to um, interpret and I sort of often sort of time my head in knots trying to make sure I understand exactly what that means. What this means is that um, <clears throat> the warmest temperate regions are um, increasing um, in, uh, in species richness um, with warming, but this effect is only detectable in the marine locations. And what, do I think this means more general? I think this is a sign of species re redistribution. Um, you may recall that I, I mentioned that we had to focus on temperate regions only, um, which are sort of poised to receive an influx of um, uh, tropical species migrating towards the poles as the places where they used to live become um, unpleasant, too warm. Um, and, and so this is not, um, a sign that climate change is great for biodiversity, not at all. It is a sign that um, um, species are changing where they live, that climate change is changing the biogeography um, uh, of, of biodiversity. Um, okay, and I'm sort of nearing the end of um, the story that I wanted to, talk, to tell you. And I wanted to finish um, uh, my talk uh, by taking you to one of my favorite places on earth. It's um, Lizard Island in the Great Barrier Reef. I've been going to Lizard Island pretty much every year since 2002. Um, this year I won't be going because COVID. Um, and, um, and it's a place uh, where we study um, 
um, community ecology of coral reefs, all kinds of things. I wanted to show off some of the uh, techniques that we're using more recently. Um, so this is, these are, I think, are some of the techniques that we might, we may end up using in the future um, to monitor biodiversity. So we use this sort of torpedo robots that you see in the top right corner there. Um, to photograph, to take thousands of photographs of reefs and then we sort of stitch them together um, to create um, these 3D uh, maps of the reef. And then we spend many, many, many hours in the water um, annotating them. Um, we also spend quite a lot of time thinking carefully about how to um, extract information about the environment and the structure of um, the reef um, from these um, sampling um, designs. However, this wonderful, wonderful place, um, Lizard Island, um, has uh, had a very um, sad recent in, um, uh, history. Um, it was hit by a sequence of um, disturbances, including two cyclones and two years of bleaching. And for those of you not familiar with the term, bleaching is when uh, corals um, uh, are exposed to water is too warm and they ex expel their symbiotic algae that they rely on for most of their um, energy and, and often, but not always, end up, end up dying. And so as a consequence of this se se series of um, se very um, sequence of very serious disturbances, um, a lizard island has seen um, a loss of 80% of the live coral on average, um, a loss of about half of the species um, that were there at the start of this, of this study. Um, this means that, you know, very vibrant reefs here, um, um, we, uh, we, and by we, I mean the Maris has um, uh, colored our um, uh, reef maps according to the uh, types of corals that live there. This is what the reef looked like in 2014 after it was hit by um, um, cyclones. Um, it lost quite a lot of the corals that lived there. Um, the corals that weren't killed by the cyclones, um, a lot of them uh, died the following year with bleaching um, or the year after that with the second year of bleaching. And so what I'm trying to say here is that um, if you collect data and if you collect data for long enough, you are almost certainly going to be faced with some, something like this where you witness um, um, drastic destruc destruction of, of your environment, of, of, the, of, your, of your study sites. Um, and it's tempting to, you know, to let the story end here and to think that this is, you know, this is what happens and, and, and the reef is now gone forever. But I, I, I want to make the point that it's not because this is what the reef looked like in 2018. And we haven't quite finished the 2019 plots yet, but all these sort of colorful dots that you see here have grown and we have more colorful dots that join them. And so, yes, we have disturbances, um, but when we lose things, we don't always lose them forever. Um, and, 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 um, and there's a lot of potential for recovery if there is enough time and space uh, for uh, recovery to happen. And um, part of the work that we're doing um, at Lizard Island is, is trying to understand uh, what are the ideal conditions for um, recovery. We're trying to quantify the structure of the reef. Um, uh, so work by uh, um, the Maris Torres Poliza um, and other people um, uh, that we published um, just a couple of weeks ago um, uh, show that there are sort of three main um, variables that we can use to, um, to quantify the structure of reefs. And that reef structure is a very good predictor of, um, uh, of diversity. And so this allows us to generate hypotheses for the parts of the reef that are most likely to recover from these very extreme um, disturbances. What I'm trying to say here is that I think the take home message from, um, from this talk um, is, is, is one of hope. Um, biodiversity change is real. Um, the effects of humans um, on, on 
on on the planet on but on, on biodiversity of the planet are are measurable and and clear um but they're also nuanced and complex um and they're also not monotonic so and what i mean by this is that when we when there's loss there's also often gain or 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 they can be gained afterwards if we give it um, sort of time and space. And I think that concludes my talk. Um, thank you very much. And I will take any questions. Um, can you hear me? OK. So thank you very much for your talk. Now we have a couple questions here. And first, Claudia Bonnecker wants to know when did the Anthropocene start, in your opinion? And why do you think some geologists discuss its validity? Right. Okay. So uh, the short answer is I don't know. And <laughs> <laughs> I think for the, per for the purposes of the work that I do, um, in many ways, it it doesn't matter exactly when the Anthropocene has started because the data that we have is all, like all of it starts after the Anthropocene has definitely started. It is, it is, um, it's controversial um, uh, exactly when the start of the Anthropocene is, uh, probably because, you know, in contrast with, you know, the, the, the previous geological um, eras, we have so, you know, such detailed information um, that we can have this argument, um, um, right? We can, we, can, we can say, we can attempt to exactly pinpoint what is the event that, um, uh, that or the combination of events that, um, that marks the start of the Anthropocene. Um, and, that, and I think the second reason why it's a controversial uh, question um, is that um, sorry? Um, it, it, is that it's it's um it's a fuzzy start. It's probably not synchronous across the entire planet. Um, it really depends. Um, um, uh, it's not synchronous across all axes that de uh, that determine the Anthropocene as well. Is this idea of sort of discrete thinking is something that humans really like to do. So we like our boundaries to be discrete, but in reality, the world is fuzzy. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, we have another question here from Mateus Morotti. And he wants to know, are richness patterns influenced by the growing number of species being described over time? That is a very good question. Um, and I would like to think no. Um, uh, I, I would like to think that the patterns we report here are not um, um, affected by um, incomplete taxonomy earlier in the in, in the time series, but I can't be a hundred percent sure um, because um, because it is too hard to check across. You know, millions of, of records exactly what is happening. Um, one of the things we are currently doing um, uh, that the Biotime team is currently doing, and actually, um, um, and also has been also done by um, Ale, Alessandra uh, Kortz, is, um, is to check uh, the, the species names are all accurate and, and we don't have issues with synonymy, um, etc. Um, which will help, hopefully helps us um, tease that apart. So thanks again. <laughs> we have a question from Juan Andres. And actually it's three questions. First, <laughs> is the turnover signal consistent with biotic homogenization. <laughs> are there examples <laughs> of the opposite? <laughs> okay, so um, uh, the, okay, the, honest, the honest answer is they are orthogonal. So the, okay. the, the, in a sense that the, the turnover that I'm referring to here is temporal turnover only. And so just 
but only by looking at the temporal turnover, we can't really tell what's happening in space. So, so we would need to um, um, quantify spatial turnover through time in order to be able to accurately answer that, um, that question. So the results that I presented here cannot tell you yes or no um, um, uh, to, to that question. Um, some preliminary, so well, some work that we've done with a different data set that was led by Anne McGurin um, showed evidence largely of climate driven um, Arctic homogenization, but that was for a subset of data from, you know, for fish from um, the North Atlantic. Um, I have now learned that I do not extrapolate beyond what the data shows. And so I don't know whether or not that generalizes. I suspect it doesn't. So thanks. Um, Vito Adriano, he says, thanks for the talk, Professor Dornelis. How do you assess the magnitude of the present mass extinction? How does your and your collaborators work fits this phenomenon? Okay, that's a question I often get, get when I talk about my work is, you know, how is it possible? You're not seeing species richness declines, but we also um, yes. have, um, are supposedly in the middle of a, of a mass extinction. How, how can the two things be true? And the answer is scale. So um, both um, scale in time and scale in space. So, um, uh, mass extinction, it's, a, it's, it's like proper extinction happens at the global scale, whereas here we're talking at, about um, uh, trends um, in, in local diversity and, you know, in a planet that has billions, you know, trillions, I don't know the numbers of, of organisms and, and millions of species, you can imagine how it's possible to have the trends at the two scales being completely disconnected. Um, and I suspect that John Chase may talk a little bit about this um, in his talk. Um, the other scale that there's a big difference is, is a temporal scale. Um, so mass extinctions occur over, you know, uh, millions, millions of years, whereas we're talking about, you know, 50 years. Um, so to be clear, we would need to keep current, so current extinction rates are elevated, but we need to keep them for thousands of years in order to lose the you know three quarters of the planet species that are characteristic of a mass extinction and what this means is that it's possible to currently have extremely elevated and very worrying um, extinction rates but also for it not being too late to stop it right so it's only if we keep going that it's a disaster So, thank you again. Um, Murilo, uh, he says, Dear Professor Dornelas, thanks for your amazing talk. And to what extent do you think most human impacts on biodiversity are more detectable at the local or regional scale? And what are the most critical steps when evaluating the threats at the global or continental scales? Oof, that is a very tricky question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, I think different threat, I think there isn't a single answer to that question. I think different threats will have different scales at which they are detectable. And I think that some threats will not be detectable at some scales. So for example, um, climate change. We, we think at the moment, the biggest effect that climate change is having um, on biodiversity is this redistribution of, of species in, 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 in space. And there's lots of different lines of evidence for that. So from you know, birds changing their migration routes to um, um, the you know, range expansion, expansions and range contractions um, to uh, the work that are presented here. So there's, there's different and independent lines of evidence that show, that suggest that there is this um, uh, shift in the distribution of, um, of species. And what that means is, is if you only look at the effects of climate change globally, you might 
not you may not detect um, a lot of change, but at the local scale, there'll be a great deal of turnover as the identities of the species that live there um, are changing. So I think it really, really depends um, on the on the on the threat um, um, in particular, what scale we would expect um, to see it to, to be more likely to detect it. Um, and and what, this mean, what I think this means is that we have to be extremely scale conscious um, uh, when we are attributing biodiversity change to, change to different um, threats. Okay, thanks again. Um, we have another question, we have lots of questions here. <laughs> Unfortunately, people will probably, we won't have enough time to answer all your questions, but we thank you all. Um, Silas, strand of species change is really interesting, but could we be missing the rare species in those studies? Did you hear me? Okay, so there was like uh, the voice broke up a little bit. I think the question was about could um, could we be missing the rarest species? Um, yes. In, in this analysis. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. Um, yes, we can, um, and that is um, a problem uh, because we know that uh, most species are rare in most places. Um, it's one of the ecological rules. It's one of the things that we learn. Um, uh, when you know when when we look at species of randomness distributions um, um, generally is that the vast majority of the species are rare. Um, however, in our analysis, one of the things that we do is is we try to control for that in, in several different ways. Um, so first of all, we we tend to work with so we use filters on the I, in my talk because I wanted to cover so much. Um, uh, so many different papers, I glossed over the details, but actually, you know, there's, there's quite a lot of methodological thinking that went behind all of, all of this work. So one of the things that we do um, is we filter uh, our time series um, for uh, ones where we have um, good coverage. And, um, like, and by coverage, I mean Chow's coverage, which is an indicator of, of how many rare species we are missing. And so there is a there is a cutoff below which we don't trust um, the, the species richness estimate. So that's one way in which we control for uh, the um, the fact that we are missing rare species. The second way in which we control for it is um, is we don't just use raw species richness. Uh, we typically use um, different estimators of, of richness, including um, um, estimators. Uh, designed by An Chao, um, which explicitly try and to take advantage of the species of distribution and, and uh, to estimate the species that were not observed, but we assume are there. Um, and, the, and the patterns that I report here are robust to all of this. So I do, so, so yes, we are most definitely missing rare species. They are impossible to sample, um, I would argue. Uh, however, I don't think that missing the rare species um, biases our conclusions. I think our conclusions are robust to that bias. So thank you. Um, Julian Nicholas, given that we are facing a fast extinction rate, would you expect an effect of the initial date of the monitoring on the effect of time on biodiversity. Could we expect that time series that started later will detect lesser effect sizes since a considered part of the species has already been extinct locally? Uh, yeah, we get that question a lot as well. Um, we, you <laughs> might, and we did have that expectation. And so we ask that explicitly um, and whether or not we see a trend in that sort of more recent um, um, time series and or time series with shorter durations um, having tending to have sort of shallower slopes. 
Um, and the answer is quite the opposite. So what we see is that the longest time series tend to have, so there isn't a real pattern. If there is a pattern, um, is that the longest time series tend to have the, the flatter trends. Thank you. <laughs> um, Maíra Cardoso, is it okay for you? More questions? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I've got all that. Uh, <laughs> Um, officially, we have until the midday, so around <laughs> 20 minutes, but feel free. Maira Cardoso, in which degree do you think the responses of terrestrial and marine biodiversity are different because of data collection bias? When you evaluate both habitats, can you recognize the effects of of sampling gaps in the results you obtained? Okay, so if I understood correctly, your question was uh, in the comparison between marine and terrestrial realms, um, do I think that the differences are due to different sampling methodologies in two realms? Was that the question? And then the second question was whether that's- Actually, no? yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and then there was a second question about um, uh, effects of gaps, right, on the time series. So I'll start with the first one. Um, so okay, so it turns out there is um, there's you know there's tons of different methods that are used to sample biodiversity, um, and uh, some methods are common across the two realms. So for example, you know, like we place quadrats in the uh, in the sea bottom or on a field somewhere, and we count the things in it. So that's pretty similar. Or we do transects, like bird transects and fish transects are not that different. Um, the other um, sampling methodologies are more realm specific. So for example, we tend not to do things like trolls um, in the terrestrial realm. Um, it would not be, I guess we do things like, you know, uh, sort of net sweeps and stuff for, uh, for invertebrates, but we tend not to kind of bulldoze a forest and count everything inside it. Um, um, we, so, we always control, so in our analysis, we always keep uh, the studies separate so that sampling methodology is included in, um, included in our models as a random effect that is um, the study and the study is defined by the methodology that is employed. So I don't think that the differences that we see um, are, um, are caused by uh, the methods themselves. It, ha it has crossed my mind that the, that space is more three-dimensional um, and more fluid um, in the oceans, particularly in sort of uh, less so in the, in the benthos, like in the sea floor, but in the pelagic region. So, so even if we have like super, super accurate latitudes and longitudes, if you go back there the following day, the, you know, the water body be beneath you is not the same. And so, um, space is more fluid um, um, in the oceans than it is um, on land. So it's, so one of the things that we did when we, were designed the, when we were deciding the appropriate spatial scale to work with was to work in a spatial scale that allowed that um, some variation in that. I, I, I do think that the differences between the realms are real though. Um, so I, don't, I think this is, these are differences of the realms themselves, not the way in which we sample the realms. Okay, so the second question was about gaps in the time series. Um, and um, I'm not sure how they would affect our results. I mean, I think the inference framework that we use um, um, Con controls for the, the, I guess, the degree of confidence. So through like our estimates of uncertainty of parameter of, of the, you know, the model parameter estimates are uh, affected by the number of points um, um, that contribute to that. So I don't 
think so, but it's hard to be 100% certain. Thanks again. Um, Julia Barreto, high diversity, often local richness, had been now most conservation, had been practiced, practiced on, something like um, people are more concerned about conservation of local species richness. That's what she said. However, many signals pile up to demonstrate biodiversity change instead of loss in response to disturbance. Can you comment on ways our applied ecological research can cope with this challenge? Yeah, okay. So that's a very good question, Julia. Um, the, you know, we've had, I don't, I don't know that we have had a, a paradigm where, you know, conservation is predicated on species richness change. I think a lot of conservation is actually more sort of species focused, but let's assume for, a second that we, that is the number that we care about how and given that's not the, the clearest signal that we find how can we make people care um about change in composition i think is what julia was is hinting at um i i want to say that um i suspect that ecologists and particularly community ecologists care more about species richness than um, than people who care about conservation is my first answer um, um, and that there are a number of ways in which we can and should be primarily concerned with composition so um, for example the consequences for ecosystem function of changes in composition is is a way in which we can do that. Um, focus on on um, on particular, like on the loss and gain of particular species that that people care about, um, is another way um, to do that. I think people's perception of what is valuable and what is not valuable is something that is fairly. It's a value judgment. It's fairly independent of the data itself, and I think narratives can be constructed um, that um, that explain why um, we, it is more important to be concerned about changing composition than it is about the total number of species. Thanks again, Maria. We're almost done. <laughs> um, Michelle de Um, if there are losers and winners, and the winners are making different regions look more similar, don't you think that we may say that we are in fact losing biodiversity? Uh, yeah, but there's yes, if that's true, yes. <laughs> but then it, uh, but then you know, there's the quite a, quite a, quite a few big jumps there, right? So, um, <laughs> so you're assuming that you have. <laughs> Um, uh, the same winners everywhere and different losers everywhere. Oh. Um, so for, for, that, for that to be true. Um, and if that is the case, yes, there is one explanation for why, you know, um, change in local richness can actually um, mean loss in regional and global richness. Um, uh, it's a, you know, it's a scale uh, specific um, answer to, to that. Um, and, and I cannot emphasize enough how important this sort of scale consideration is. Um, there are different reasons why we care about biodiversity. Um, one of the reasons why we care about biodiversity is, um, um, is about the effect of, the, of diversity on, on ecosystem function. And that is largely mediated at the local scale, not the regional scale. And so you may, you may end up in a poorer world in terms of global richness where ecosystems are still have the same number of species or or not so it uh, the point here being that um we we've now learned and and we did like you know i we didn't know this when we started we assumed um i assumed um, when we set out to do this, that we would find 
a degree of loss. I thought when we, like back in 2010, when we started assembling Biotime, I thought that I was going to be writing about how, I don't know, mammals were declining faster than birds or something to that effect. Um, it was only through sort of engaging with the data that I found that's not quite the case. It's more complicated than that. And I think it's important that we understand sort of the nuances and um, the complexity of um, uh, the change that is unfolding so that we can manage it appropriately. Thank you very much for your question. I, I think we have more two questions. Is that okay for you? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> The first one is from Marcus, and he wants to know uh, what do you think about citizen science, like peop ordinary people collecting data for scientists and monitoring this big data in the last years about like all this data that has been collected by people and can they optimize modeling the biodiversity in the world? I think he's telling that using uh, citizen science, is that okay? Is that good for optimizing the understanding of biodiversity? I guess. Okay, so I would start by saying that I think citizen science is brilliant um, because, you know, engaging people in science and not just scientists, but anyone in science is awesome. It means it brings people closer to science. It recruits scientists. It means it brings science closer to people. It, it is absolutely absolutely brilliant um there are very very different types of citizen science uh, data in biotime we include some data that is uh, collected by citizen scientists for example the very famous american british uh, uh not british <laughs> breeding birds <laughs> <laughs> you can tell i'm very tired <laughs> um, uh, survey is collected by uh, uh, volunteer bird watchers um the the biggest difficulty in dealing with um, citizen science data is, is being able to, um, to ensure data quality. Um, because, I mean, ecological data is already so noisy that if we include um, a lot of observation error, that, that we are actually able to detect signals. So it's finding the right balance between um, uh, the data that can and cannot be used to answer different kinds of questions, and um, I think needs to be done by applying sort of thresholds in terms of quality control of the data. Um, for biodiversity uh, data in particular, a really, really important point is that the um, sampling methodology needs to be standardized, um, because otherwise we can't be sure um, whether uh, I guess this relates to the previous question about rare species. Um, so uh, we can't be sure if sort of differences in species richness, for example, are driven by actual fluctuations in species richness or just differences in sampling effort. The more we sample, the more species we find. Um, and so um, depending on the questions you're asking of the data, you might need to, um, uh, to apply different quality control criteria to filter out the data that you can and you cannot use. But regardless of whether or not we use the data to do science, um, I think it is great to engage people in collecting data, in observing the natural world. And in because um, if people don't even see it, they can't possibly value it, right? So, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. And now the last question um, from Fernanda Brum. The temporal patterns of biodiversity loss or turnover were consistent among taxa. Is there any taxa more deeply affected? Okay, so um, as always, the answer is it's complicated. <laughs> um, uh, it's not as if like all taxa are behaving exactly in the same ways. Um, it's more that there aren't very clear differences among taxa in most trends. There are some differences that emerge. So for example, in the paper that Gergana Daskalova uh, published in Science earlier this year, um, she had a look at uh, time lags between sort of peak deforestation and peak change in, in um, uh, sort of um, 
uh, richness as well as population trends. And she found that longer lived um, species tend to have longer lags between the disturbance events and um, biodiversity um, change. So it's not as if you know all the attacks are the same. No, is that the uh, the trends are not super consistent either. Um, it depends on where and and when different things have happened. So Maria, thank you again very much. It's an honor for us to to have you here sharing your all your knowledge and experience in ecology. And thanks for your patience in answering all uh, the questions. We had more questions. I, I guess people really are involved and in, in interested in the, these topics you're talking about. But unfortunately, guys, we don't have time for, for all your questions. So we're sorry and we thank you for your participation. Um, as you know, we are uh, streaming live this, this video on YouTube. So for you guys on YouTube, uh, at 2 p.m. in the Brazilian time, uh, we'll have another talk. So thanks for your participation here with us. Now we're going to have the lunch time, which unfortunately is not personal, like in person. <laughs> and we'll be back at 2 p.m., as I said. So don't lose. E para vocês que estão participando aqui também, falar também em português, né? A gente está voltando às duas horas, então, com a próxima palestra, não percam. E muito obrigado, professora Maria Dornelas, pela sua participação. Obrigada eu pelo convite e pelas perguntas todas. Um, é excelente, um, é um grande prazer e talvez um dia um, a gente faça uma coisa deste género ao vivo. <risos> Seria maravilhoso. <risos> então, com essa... A gente se despede. Tchau, tchau. Obrigada e adeus. Muito obrigado. Muito obrigado.